I'm going to talk today about lipids and lipoproteins and the testing of these things. And what I'm going to do is sort of end up somewhere halfway between, between where you are at evaluating analytes of various types and where I am in doing, studying the pathophysiology of lipoprotein disorders. And what I'm going to do is really cover two areas. One is what is the role of lipids and lipoproteins in premature atherosclerosis. And if we have time, I'll talk about severe hypertriglyceridemia in acute recurrent pancreatitis. An outline of what I'm going to cover is, you know, why measure lipids? That's sort of my area. Uh, what to measure? That's your area. You know, how we uh, uh, put them together and when to measure them and when we put them together, how do we develop guidelines and goals and are these reasonable sort of things or uh, what kind of problems do, do we have? This slide shows data from the mid-1980s. A third of a million men, more than a third of a million men, had uh, lipids measured. They were followed for six years for coronary heart uh, death uh, rates. And on the vertical axis, we have the age-adjusted uh, per thousand uh, men, uh, six-year coronary heart disease death rate as a function of increasing cholesterol at baseline. And as you can see, there's this marked increase with increasing cholesterol. Now, we've known for years that people with very high cholesterol levels, probably since 1905, 1910, that people with familial hypercholesterolemia with LDL receptor defects, that wasn't known at the time, but they had very high cholesterol, they had premature coronary disease. And it was these kind of data that suggested that in fact this is a general phenomenon in the population. Now the main reason I show this slide is these are the data from which the National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines started. So at this point, this bend right here, values above there, so above two, a total cholesterol above 240, and that's how they defined a high uh, total cholesterol. Desirable was down here where things have leveled off more or less, and that was called desirable cholesterol. And in between, unfortunately, they called this borderline high. Now, if they'd called it borderline, things would have been great, but when they called it borderline high, it suddenly became very abnormal. In fact, I'm going to show you today that some of the people in here are at risk for coronary disease as much as these people, and over half of them are at no risk at all for premature coronary artery disease. These are actually data uh, somewhere earlier. I'm not sure when it was. I made this slide in 1979, but it makes a point, I think, very well. We're talking about lipid abnormalities and premature coronary artery disease, and these are data from Framingham. Uh, started collection in the 1960s, I believe, and this is early 70s, you can see that if you're 30 to 39 at entry with increasing cholesterol levels, your increase in coronary heart disease was almost five-fold increase compared to the lowest uh, value that they made, or under 200 milligrams per deciliter, as compared to those who are 40 to 49 and 50 to 59. This, this sort of observation is held up. But it's been ignored, I think, mainly because the, there's a group of people who make certain compounds that want to sell them, related to what we were talking about a minute ago, named statins. And uh, there's now an NIH study being started looking at 100,000 people over the age of 70 to actually evaluate whether it makes any difference in the, real, the actual elderly people uh, if they're hypercholesterolemic. It's important. Uh, to document that changing this cholesterol actually has an effect. And this is the Scandinavian Synvastatin Survival uh, Study, the 4S study. Uh, it was published in 1984. The first statin became available in 1987. It's called Lovastatin. Synvastatin was number two. And as you can see, over six years since randomization to placebo or synvastatin, those that had the placebo had poorer survival than those who were treated with synvastatin. In fact, there was a 30 percent reduction in coronary heart disease. Now, there are about five or six statins, and every statin does exactly the same thing. They decrease coronary disease by about 30 percent. What I'm going to talk about today, in addition to what you measure, is what about doing something about these people who are treated with statin and still got coronary disease uh, in spite of having their cholesterol lowered. Part of it is that single monotherapy is often not enough. And now that the drug companies are through with all the monotherapy trials, people are starting to do trials with combined therapy. And actually the first one was familial atherosclerosis treatment study, or FATS, that was done here at the University of Washington by Greg Brown in the cardiology division and published in the New England Journal in 1990. What he did is he enrolled 120 middle-aged men 
who had a family history of coronary disease, had an elevated ApoB, that, that value at that time, and coronary artery disease by an angiogram. He randomized them to therapy, either double therapy with these drugs, double therapy with these drugs, or conventional therapy, was, which was diet and cholesterol alone if you had a very high LDL. Double therapy caused coronary disease regression by repeat angiogram two and a half years later. The people who were on the conventional therapy had coronary artery disease progression. Now what he was able to show in his original publication, this is actually a visual presentation of stepwise multiple regression. So that what this is, the change in coronary stenosis by angiogram over two and a half years is a function of change in a number of variables and the computer picks out the variable that has the most impact. And change in LDL cholesterol explained about 20% of the variation in coronary disease. In other words, 20% of the regression was associated with change in LDL cholesterol. This could be replaced with ApoB. If you took the LDL cholesterol out and put in ApoB, it would come, it would come here. If you leave it in, it falls in up here somewhere. So LDL cholesterol, HDL2 subfraction of the HDL cholesterol came in second place. Well, I was the familial part of fats, and I studied the families of these individuals, and also studied some lipoprotein subfractions at the same time back in the 80s. And what we found is that if we measured peak LDL density or buoyancy, there's just the opposite side of the same thing, that change in LDL buoyancy, that is getting rid of small dense LDL particles, predicted 35% of the change in coronary stenosis and put LDL cholesterol into a distant second place. So in fact, there are things more than just LDL that might be important. And I'm not recommending that we measure them, but as a research tool, I think this can be very important. Now the reason I'm going through Greg Brown's studies is that after the study was over in 1989, He's followed half of these men with premature coronary disease in their, middle, in their 40s and 50s now for 20 years. And these are data from 14 years or so. If they stayed with Greg Brown, he put them on triple therapy and had followed them in this, these data for 10 years. And on triple therapy, the freedom from death or myocardial infarction was about 95% as compared to people who returned to their cardiologists on monotherapy whose survival was only 80%. Now he's followed these people for 20 years now, and in fact, he, both of these two people, one died and the other one had an MI, got out of the study, went off triple therapy before this happened. There's only been one coronary angiogram in the subsequent 20 years. You can prevent premature coronary artery disease if you know what the defect is and you treat them appropriately. I think that that's something that's, that's not generally appreciated, but in fact, uh, Greg is now following up these people so he can publish the 20-year follow-up. Monotherapy, in some cases, is not the best sort of thing. Now, the idea of combination therapy is a new one to the general populace, and there are two <coughs> pending trials of adding a niacin or a niacin placebo to baseline statin therapy to see if, in fact, they can reproduce the results that Greg has shown. One of them is a study called AIM High. It's in the United States, actually here in Seattle. Greg Brown is the PI. It's, multi, it's something like 3,600 people in 28 centers. The other is the heart protection study number two called Thrive, which is going on in the UK. And they'll be out in about five years. The other lipoprotein of importance is high density lipoprotein or healthy, happy HDL. This is actually a, shot, a slide that I borrowed from Sean Egger. Uh, who gave a nice talk a couple weeks ago uh, about uh, using mass spec to study lipoproteins. But HDL transports cholesterol back to the liver from, for excretion. So in other words, ApoB particles deliver cholesterol to the periphery, H HDL brings it back, and that's the way that the cholesterol enters the biliary tract and for biliary excretion. It also delivers cholesterol to steroidogenic tissues like the uh, gonads and the adrenal. And it protects against atherosclerosis hypothetically by this reverse cholesterol transport mechanism, by its anti-inflammatory effects in the arterial wall, and by antioxidizing effects of the proteins that are carried on HDL. And it's about 50% protein, 25% cholesterol ester, and 25% phospholipid. But that composition varies a lot from the very small particles to very cholesterol-rich particles. Now, in Framingham, 
like they did for LDL cholesterol, they showed that HDL cholesterol prevented or was associated with less coronary artery disease. So here's the morbidity risk ratio for coronary heart disease uh, in Framingham over uh, a compared, uh, over a range of HDL cholesterol, very low at very high HDL cholesterols and much higher at very low HDL cholesterol. So naturally the hypothesis was, well, let's do something to raise HDL cholesterol levels. And one such study is the torsepribib study. This is a compound that inhibits cholesterol ester transfer protein that takes the cholesterol off the HDL when it's back, going back to the liver and either gives it to the liver or gives it to LDL. And it actually is a way of facilitating the return part of, the, of reverse cholesterol transport. People had known that if you had a defect in CETP, the very rare disorder of high HDL levels. So let's inhibit HDL and see what happens. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the people on, on a statin only, they're both on statins. These people were on the active drug, the CETP inhibitor, and had increased death during the course of the study. And this was in part accounted for by an increase in the number of major cardiovascular events. The study didn't work. Now, why did this happen? Well, one thing that was noted is that this particular cholesterol ester transfer uh, inhibitor actually was associated with an increase in uh, hypertension, blood pressure. That's one of the possible effects. It was about three or four millimeters of mercury. The second, which is one that I favor from the very beginning, was it actually shuts off or decreases reverse cholesterol transport. By the way, John Glomsett, who is a professor emeritus in our division, he's now in his mid-80s, I think, actually hypothetically described this thing when he was uh, an assistant professor back here in the 50s, the, the whole concept of reverse cholesterol transport. Um, so that, that if, if you actually shut off part of the clearance mechanisms and you accumulate HDL cholesterol, maybe it's because it isn't being removed. That isn't the concept that would be beneficial from my point of view. Now these HDL that, that accumulate are called dysfunctional HDL, and some people think it's, that's the problem, that the HDL isn't working. My idea is that probably because they've shut off reverse cholesterol transport, these are old guys. They've been around circulating a long, long time, and they no longer have the capacity for doing what they're supposed to do. And then a distant possibility, maybe not so distant, is that HDL is a marker, is a collinear factor with other lipoprotein fractions. So it's really a marker for other lipid abnormalities, and HDL itself doesn't really have any effect. Maybe it, does, it isn't important. Now, if we look at premature coronary disease and lipids, I've talked about total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL. But in fact, I think we know quite a bit more about this, and we can measure these things. LDL cholesterol is the backbone for most of what's gone on so far. There's another LDL cholesterol particle called L lipoprotein little a, or LP little a. It's an LDL particle secreted independently of all the other lipoproteins that have an extra protein on it called APOA. Now APOA is a homologue of plasminogen. It has, the plasminogen has five Kringles, and in Kringle 5 it has a catalytic site that breaks down fibrinogen, fibrin, I mean. And this thing has those same things, multiple copies of Kringle 4, and in Kringle 5 it's catalytic, the, the uh, catalytic site is inactive, so in fact, it may, in fact, be a prothrombotic, as well since it's on an LDL particle, pro, a prolipid, a proatherosclerotic uh, particle, and seems to be associated with increased risk. It's almost 100% associated, 100% inherited, so it's difficult to modify. Other defects I implied a little bit earlier that small, dense LDL may be bad for the artery. They get in better, they bind better to the, to the proteoglycan matrix. Uh, they're more easily modified in the modified form that can be taken out by macrophages. So there's a lot of reasons to think these might be bad guys. There are remnant lipoproteins left after lipoprotein lipase takes the triglyceride out of the particle. The remnant goes to liver, then it's converted into LDL. These are things that are, that are increased in a number of disorders at minor levels, but the major defect is when you have a defect in what's called apolipoprotein E, and you have type 3 hyperlipidemia, and of course, decrease hype, uh, HDL cholesterol. <coughs> now these three things here in yellow are associated with hypertriglyceridemia and it looks as if fasting hypertriglyceridemia is a marker for an increase in these li remnant lipoproteins, increased small dense LDL particles, 
and decreased HDL2 and using some very labor intensive uh, tools, Marion Chung over at the Northwest Lipid Research Laboratory has shown that it's an A1 only HDL2 particle. So they can actually find a very small uh, component of the whole HDL that may in fact be the anti-atherosclerotic uh, uh, particle. Now in our clinic, if we measure all of these things in people with premature coronary artery disease that are sent to us, and sometimes people send them people to us because we don't, they don't seem to have any defect at all in their lipoproteins, and when we measure things that aren't routinely measured, uh, we usually find something, and there's almost <coughs> nobody that has no identifiable abnormality in a lipoprotein. We have three people. One is a 34-year-old woman who has absolutely normal lipids until you use mass spec to look at her HDL, and it's very abnormal, even though her HDL cholesterol is normal, and two others that we don't know out of thousands of people. So lipoproteins are a critical component for premature coronary artery disease. So what to measure? Lab medicine here at UW Medical Center measures a lipid profile, which as you know is a total cholesterol, an HDL cholesterol, and triglyceride, and then calculates using various paradigms other components of the lipoproteins. So the LDL cholesterol is calculated by looking at these factors here and taking the total cholesterol, subtracting the HDL, the triglyceride divided by five, and you end up with an LDL cholesterol that's pretty close to the more labor-intensive uh, sequential ultracentrifugation. And this has been done universally around the world now since the early 1980s. A second thing that's now being reported is the non-HDL cholesterol, and I'll show you why that's important in a little while. It's simply the total cholesterol minus the HDL, and it represents all of the particles in the outgoing system, that is the ApoB-containing particles being secreted by the gut and the liver. And then Framingham has had a, very, a, a favorite of the total divided by HDL cholesterol, which you report, which I think probably doesn't add very much if you think of these other, these other sort of things. And the question is, should it be fasting or non-fasting specimens? And if you're just measuring lipids, in, as I suggested here, it has to be fasting because when you eat a meal, you change the triglyceride, and that has an effect on everything else you do. So if you're doing lipids only, uh, or if you're doing lipids primarily, it has to be a fasting specimen. And the patients, they can do it. They come back on another day and get it fasting. Now, there are other things you can measure, and these are the apolipoproteins related to atherosclerosis. ApoB <clears throat> is a measure of all of, there's one per particle that comes out of the liver or the intestine. So you can actually count the number of lipoprotein particles in LDL or intermediate density lipoproteins or VLDL or whatever you want to call them. And it's now standardized. There's a, a calibrator that's been developed, actually it's been developed by the Northwest Lipid Research Clinic. And the IFCC uses it uh, as a standard around the world. Coefficient of variation is between three and, 10, three and eight percent, depending on what laboratory you're in. ApoA1 is the major protein in HDL. Both of this can be measured in, at, uh, here at Lab Medicine. These two are measured at Northwest Lipid and other places. Uh, I don't really use this very often. I've already talked about this. I think this is important. Now, there's a large market out there and other ways of looking at lipoproteins, looking at lipoprotein subfractions. There's the vertical auto profile, or VAP, which is a density gradient ultracentrifuge, an ultracentrifuge technique by Athrotech in Birmingham, Alabama. I actually helped develop this technique when the person who started the company down there was here on sabbatical in the, in the late 80s. The Berkeley Heart Lab does a gradient gel electrophoresis uh, for LDL size. Uh, that's a very popular technique. And then recently, Liposcience is, is using NMR to count the number of LDL particles. Now, I measure ApoB and LPA in my clinic. I, for years, have measured both of these things in my lab as research tools, but I have, I've never used them clinically. I don't think they're necessary. When the results come back to the physician who orders them, they're overwhelmingly complicated and uninterpretable, and that's one of the reasons we get patients sent to us. Can you interpret this form for me? And I say, you shouldn't have ordered it in the first place. And as I'll talk, uh, there's another thing called the direct LDL cholesterol uh, that's problematic. So here's what we measure, ApoB, LPA, and I don't think everybody has to do it. We do it in everybody who comes to our clinic. 
And if you're looking just at lipoproteins, these don't have to be fat, these don't have to be fasting. That's one advantage of measuring proteins instead of lipids. If you measure most, and most groups suggest you do measure most, uh, then you have to be fasting. So there have been lots of studies comparing different methodologies for evaluating lipoproteins. I talked about non-HDL cholesterol. It's a routine part of the lipid profile here. Uh, if you compare it to measures of LDL cholesterol in themselves, non-HDL cholesterol is a better predictor of coronary risk than LDL cholesterol is. And that's because not only does it include the LDL cholesterol, but it includes more buoyant lipoproteins that also have one ApoB particle, one ApoB molecule per particle. I've talked about apolipoprotein B, and this has also been shown in multiple studies to be better than LDL cholesterol. And some of the reservations of changing from LDL to one of these, or to do both, is people are concerned about educating practicing physicians in the community, that, that, that it might overwhelm them with the information you're providing to them. I don't think that's really the case. If you do a ratio of ApoB to ApoA1, this is the sort of like the total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio. I'll show you a little bit later. This is a phenomenally powerful epidemiologic tool. You can do it in non-fasting in thousands of people, and it turns out to be a major contributor of premature coronary artery disease and coronary disease in the elderly as well. And then there's NMR. Now the reason, I think I, I, I don't know what I'm going to talk about here or later, so I'll do it right here. My problem with NMR <clears throat> is that it's a black box output from a company run by a single individual who decides what's going on, and it's, it is no better than this. I think this is probably better. They both measure the total number of particles. This is probably reasonable and validated. It's expensive, and nobody's suggesting that, it, that it be done, that it be used, except for LipoScience and Jim Otvos, who owns the company. Now, references for this the, all of this stuff are on this next slide. And there's a lot of data. I think the data are now overwhelmingly uh, uh, convincing that ApoB is better than LDL, non-HDL cholesterol is better than LDL, and NMR for LDL particle number is better than LDL cholesterol. And this most recent one in the uh, American Association of Clinical Chemists has just come out online, and it's a very good review of this whole issue. I've included this paper here uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a paper written about standardization and validation of the direct cholesterol method. And the direct, cholesterol, direct LDL cholesterol method is, is using a series of compounds to precipitate particles of, with either, either HDL or bigger particles with more lipid in them so that the only thing that's left that's measured is the LDL particle. The trouble with it is, is that LDL is a polydispersed molecule, a particle, and it has a big range of variation of the amount of cholesterol ester to ApoB. And so the, if you use a particular thing to precipitate lipoproteins, some of the big fat LDL are precipitated, and the little ones aren't, and other systems, you, the little ones are and the big ones aren't. So in fact, it's been very difficult to standardize. The, it also had the same problem here is this is also a black box. One company does this and they don't tell you what they use to precipitate the lipoproteins. But this article here actually looks like they've now changed the direct, cluster, direct LDL cholesterol methodology. They've changed the, the material used to precipitate the lipoproteins. And this suggests that, in fact, direct LDL may have some value in the future. And I'll get back to why that may be important in a second. So this is UWMC Lipid Clinic uh, here in this building. What we do there is we measure lipid profile and non-HDL cholesterol. You just added this at our request to the report form in the last couple of months. And it's, uh, we've been using this uh, for a long time. And I guess it's now there's a whole bunch of, of agencies, the American Heart, American Diabetes Association, et cetera, et cetera, that are suggesting that since you don't have to do any further measurement, you just do a calculation that it's reported. And it can be very helpful. As I said, we measure ApoB, we measure LPA, and measuring just these things, we can evaluate the presence or absence of abnormalities in this whole spectrum of lipoproteins. So what about fasting triglyceride levels at higher levels, greater than 400 milligrams per deciliter? Above 400, the free-to-all calculation for LDL is not accurate. And the, the, if you look at a comparison between 
the gold standard ultra centrifugation and LDL cholesterol, the correlation between the two is about 0.9 something up to about 400, and then it splays out. And for various reasons, it's not accurate. Now, what we do is use non HDL cholesterol because it tells us how many, what the cholesterol is in all of those particles. And we also use ApoB that tells us how many particles there are. Now, part of the problem is, is that the NCQA, which is sponsored the National Committee for Quality Assurance, and there are two major sponsors of the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, are now using guidelines that people have suggested. And they're determining salaries based on whether or not you reach the guidelines. And so direct LDLs become important not for clinical purposes, but because as an organization say, you have to reach these goals. If you don't, then you may not get hired by this company or this hospital. You may not get paid as much. There's a whole bunch of social and political implications uh, going along with the guideline that says you have to get everybody down to this goal. And I still don't think this is needed, but politically and socially, it, it can be a problem. And I'm going to go back to this in a little while. There's no sense at all in measuring LDL subfractions because when you get hypertriglyceridemic, these particles get very triglyceride rich and are giving off triglyceride in exchange for cholesterol and the whole system changes and we don't have any idea what it means. So these have no role at all in people with more severe hypertriglyceridemia. Now this is another slide from Sean. Uh, I'm going to go through briefly some of the prospective studies uh, because I think some of them point out things that are, that are of interest. So these are studies linking ApoB and an increase in cardiovascular risk. The studies are, as a group are strongly predictive of cardiovascular disease and the Morris is a study, a uh, population-based study of 175,000 men and women in Sweden where they showed that ApoB remained a significant risk factor of fatal MI even after you adjust for all the other known risk factors including LDL and HDL. Now, you can't say that about LDL. LDL, in fact, in males didn't predict coronary disease, or maybe it was females, one or the other. But in fact, this is a very powerful tool. This is a very powerful study, and it's on that list that I gave you. The second study, which I think is important, is the Quebec cardiovascular study. And they showed that ApoB was a strong independent predictor of cardiac events. This study took 2,500 men in Quebec City who were free of coronary disease has now followed them. They've published data on them for up to 13 years of follow-up. And ApoB was an independent predictor of risk. Also, they showed that HDL2 cholesterol was an independent predictor. And very recently, they've shown that small dense LDL, if you take all the people who at baseline had big LDL particles or small LDL particles and you follow them for 13 years, the people who had big LDL had no increase in risk of coronary disease at all. The people with small LDL had all of the risk that's been accounted for by LDL cholesterol uh, as, uh, as the whole LDL component. In this, this is a very interesting study, and, and uh, I, I think it talks a lot about the things that people are interested in lipoproteins. And recently, the American Diabetes Association, the American College of Cardiology, have supported the idea of reporting non-HDL and actually measuring ApoB in addition to uh, the routine lipid profile. Now, people have complained that ApoB levels uh, are not accurately measured, they're not readily available, and there's no standardization. And I think in the last 15, 5, 10, 15 years, these have, all these problems have been solved. I put these data up here because one of the problems is in, when you measure HDL and you look at a population, this is NHANES 3, ApoB was measured by Santika Markovina in 12,000 people uh, back in the late 90s, I believe it was. And here in, you know, she measured them here in Seattle, but they're the NHANES population. And you can see that both in men and women, if you look at the 50 percentile here are women, this is a function of increasing age, that it goes up continuously with age. The same thing is true in men. So that is an age-affected variable. Now, the 90th percentile is here, and you can, you, can get, you can get, actually, there's enough people here to actually look at values for percentiles, 90th percentile for men and women of different ages. And how does this match with what is measured here uh, in your lab medicine value? Your reported normal high is 150 milligrams per deciliter, which, in fact, actually, 
lines up here at about the, the 90th percentile, perhaps a little above the 90th percentile for men age 50 and older. So in fact, that's actually a pretty good, pretty good guess. I think it was a guess when the, that value was picked. I, there was no data on which to really uh, choose it. And the same thing is true in women. However, it's important to realize that if you're below the age of 50, both in men and women, uh, the value is too high. It's like the 99 point something percentile uh, for ApoB, and it misses people who are in the same families as these old people who are older people. They're not old at all, from my point of view, but these older people, uh, when they, but in fact, uh, in the right combination, they're still getting premature coronary artery disease. The Interheart study was a case control study for acute MI that was done all over the world. This is an international study now. They, they had 9,000 uh, cases and 12,000 controls, and these are non-fasting specimens, which that doesn't make any difference because they measured ApoB and A1. And they showed that the population attributable risk for acute MI was related to a group of nine risk factors, and when they were all combined, it counted for over 90% of the risk for coronary disease, and that's allowing for all the errors of measurement and all that other stuff. Uh, this was published in 2004. These are data looking at apolipoprotein B to A1 ratio in myocardial infarction. And the controls, if you divide them up by uh, deciles of ApoB over A1 here and then compare them to the cases, and you can calculate the odds ratio, you can see it goes up over four down to one over those, those ten uh, categories. And it's a linear effect with a pretty small confidence interval, large numbers. Uh, if you look at other risk factors, I'm only going to show you four additional ones. This is the odds ratio plus the 99% confidence interval. Uh, you can see that diabetes also is about four, and these other things come through about as reported in other, other studies. Now, if you look at the odds ratio of ApoBA1 together, it's important to actually look at the effect once again of age. Those under 65 and those older 65 that I've defined here as younger and older, the odds ratio of an MI in the cases compared to controls is over four as compared to two and a half. If you took all nine risk factors, the odds ratio, if you had all of them, was 216 to one. So in fact, I think we can predict who actually is going to have coronary disease, and it isn't just premature coronary disease, and it isn't just in this country, it's all over the world. So what about guidelines? The National Cholesterol Education Program Adult Treatment Panel began back in the early 80s or so. And they're now in the Adult Treatment Panel 3, and these are their guidelines. They recommend measuring LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, total, triglycer total cholesterol and triglycerides. Actually, this is calculated. The, the guidelines are based on LDL cholesterol. This is the cornerstone for risk. And the guidelines are, and the targets are for LDL therapy only. Actually, that's not quite true. Li um, what do they call it? Lifestyle modification uh, is also very important. And what they've done is they've taken risk categories and divided them into high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And high risk means you already have coronary disease. You have a coronary heart disease equivalent. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Medium risk is you have two common risk factors, low risk, uh, in fact, you can have quite a high LDL cholesterol and get along without uh, much trouble uh, according to these, these particular guidelines. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to do is just put, blow this up so we can actually look at it in more detail. They've actually defined the LDL goal. If you're above 100, you should institute lifestyles if you're high risk. If you're above 130, you'll start drug therapy. And so there's actually a pretty concrete flow sheet that can be used. It's not too bad. It actually is quite effective, although it overtreats some people, particularly older people. Now, the coronary disease, heart disease, if you've already had it, you're at very high risk for another event. The risk equivalents are other clinical atherosclerotic disease like carotid disease, carotid uh, atherosclerosis, peripheral vascular disease, things like that. Diabetes is a, has been determined to be a, a coronary disease risk equivalent. If you have diabetes at 50 and you haven't had a prior event, you have the same chance of having an event as a non-diabetic who's already had one myocardial infarction, and that's where this term came from.
And then they also say if there's more than two risk factors with a 10-year risk greater than 20% for concrete coronary heart disease, and the risk factors are blood pressure, low ACL, family history of early coronary disease. And this is the Framingham risk score, which is very strongly uh, biased by the effects of age, and I don't find it very helpful, but it's part of the guidelines. And actually, one of the important things here, they mentioned metabolic syndrome for the first time in risk calculation, and I think that was probably a mistake, and I'm going to show you why. In NCEP ATP uh, 3, they coined the term metabolic syndrome, and they said it was made up of abdominal obesity, increased waist circumference, high triglycerides, a low HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, and fasting glucose elevation. All you had to have was one of the three of these things, and you called that the metabolic syndrome. And there have been 25,000 papers since this was first published about the metabolic syndrome, uh, most of which hasn't been very important because, in fact, they've never, nobody's ever shown that these individual components contribute less than the group all combined together. But, in fact, it's made, it, it's made the area, uh, 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 people in practice are now aware of the combination of these sort of things. Now, if we look at the, mis the metabolic syndrome and dyslipidemia, and I'm going to diverge for a second here, whatever, this is the population that meets the criteria in that previous slide. We know that people with type 2 or adult onset diabetes, almost all of them have the metabolic syndrome. They're centrally obese, they have mild elevations in triglyceride, low HDL, they're more prone to have hypertension. Of course, by definition, they have high glucose levels. Another disease called familial combined hyperlipidemia, which may be the most common cause of non-diabetic premature coronary artery disease uh, is another thing that's also associated in about 80 percent of them with central obesity, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we look at premature coronary disease in terms of this paradigm here, it turns out that 20 to 30 percent of men and women with premature coronary disease have type 2 diabetes. Another 15 to 20 percent have familial combined hyperlipidemia. And if you say, well, let's, how do we do this? There, you, you define diabetes by measuring glucose levels. Here's where ApoB comes in. If you have a lipid profile with an elevated ApoB, if you don't have a high LPA, you don't have familial hypercholesterolemia, you have familial combined hyperlipidemia. These two things account for about 40% of premature coronary disease. So here I'm looking at the whole pie now. Here's type 2 diabetes, here's familial combined hyperlipidemia. We're looking at hypertriglyceridemia and premature coronary disease. Polycystic ovarian syndrome in women probably accounts for some of this. They're centrally obese. It appears that even though they don't have the hirsutism necessarily anymore when they get older, those women are predestined to get premature coronary disease. And there's a thing called familial hypoalpha lipoproteinemia, or familial low HDL cholesterol, that's also not too well defined. But they account for perhaps half of the coronary disease. Now, people have looked at the metabolic syndrome and taken the type 2 diabetics out and said there's an increase in risk of coronary disease, but they've never taken these people out. And we don't know if half of the people said to have the metabolic syndrome are at risk or not. It's really an unanswered question. This is really an important paper to read. It's in JAMA a couple of years ago. David Kent and Rod Hayward are interested in uh, trying to do risk assessment. If you look at baseline risk, what group of people do you want to treat and what price do you have to pay to make that treatment? What, the, what this upper curve is, is a, the distribution of baseline outcome risk for any disease, and their, their example is premature coronary artery disease. And people, there's a, most of the people aren't at risk, and then it's skewed out here to higher values, and these people are at increasing risk. And I think I'll just leave this alone for the, we don't need to, well, actually what this does, it says that if, you, if you're at very high risk, then the, even if you have just a very small amount of harm, then you actually benefit from therapy to lower that risk. But if you're at low risk, down in here somewhere, and even though there's just very mild harm, the harm now outweighs the benefit from therapy in people at low risk. Now, if we take what I just said a few minutes ago and say, well, these are the people who have type 2 diabetes and familial combined hyperlipidemia, we can identify them as being people at high risk, and everybody agrees that they should be treated aggressively. 
what about anybody else here? How do we identify these people and what do we do about them? Now, if we do a patient, high-risk patient focused assessment of, and looking for patients, that means that we unload half of the people that are being treated. So I'm talking about stopping statins, as you suggested a minute ago. I think we're over-treating the population and not looking for the people who are at the highest risk. A very good second paper uh, just came out in JAMA as well this month uh, by Alan Schneiderman and Kurt Ferberg, who also discussed the issues with the goals that we set, how the goals really have to be reanalyzed and redefined. How about targeted risk reduction? Well, the first thing that everybody agrees, if somebody comes in the hospital, a 52-year-old male has an acute myocardial infarction, on entry, the hospital here now automatically measures a lipid profile. And they start them on a statin. No matter what happens, they start them on a statin. And I think that's not a bad idea. They then have them come back in three months when the, acute, the effect of the acute stress is gone. You know, if you have a myocardial infarction and your HDL was normal, two days later it's going to be down in the basement. It's, a, it's an acute fa phase reactant and it drops. So we get this guy, we see him three months later, and then we modify his therapy dependent on what lipoprotein abnormalities we see that with him now that he's on a statin. The important thing to do at three months is say, tell me about your kids, the adult children you have. These genetic disorders constant, are concentrated in families. That's not surprising. Uh, the ones that I've been talking about today, except for familial hypercholesterolemia, don't manifest themselves as hyperlipidemia until, ki until the kids have gone through adolescent growth spurt. The other place to look is the siblings of this person, and if you find an, ab an affected individual here, go after that person's adult children. That's not, a, that's not a standard procedure anywhere except in people who think on a on familial basis of disease, but it's something that I think should be really emphasized. So I'm left with two conundrums. One is this National Committee for Quality Assurance, where the attainment of LDL cholesterol goals might determine your salary or whether or not you're hired, et cetera, et cetera, and it's getting more and more uh, of a problem. And maybe it's okay if one can measure LDL because, you know, if, if you accept the, goal, the goals concept, then measuring LDL is easy if you're not very hypertriglyceridemic. But if you're hypertriglyceridemic, say over 400 milligrams per deciliter, there's no easy way to measure LDL cholesterol easily. And this is where the direct LDL measurement has gained most of its fire. You know, the, the, we're being told that we have to get the LDL cholesterol below a certain value. We don't know how to measure it, so we'll use this technique that I think is not validated and is inaccurate. So I think the real, the real way to handle this particular conundrum is to change what the NCQA says and accept non-HDL cholesterol as an alternative for LDL cholesterol, and that may happen. The other is that coronary artery disease in the elderly is associated with hypertension and chronic renal disease, mild chronic renal disease, and it doesn't appear that dyslipidemia accounts for a lot of the coronary disease in the elderly. In fact, there's a study called PROSPER where treatment with a statin in people who do not have coronary disease manifest clinically at age 70, but they're still hyperlipidemic, you put them on a statin and it doesn't change anything. So in fact, there are even data with therapy to suggest that there's something going on, and that's the basis of this uh, study that's coming up of 100,000 elderly, older elderly people. So in summary, the atherosclerosis thing, if we're screening for things, I think a lipid profile with a non-HDL cholesterol in the report is I think all you need to do, this should be fasting. <clears throat> for further refining the risk in dyslipidemic patients, I think the measurement of ApoB in addition to non-HDL cholesterol is helpful, and LPA is a risk factor that has about the same risk in addition to all the other things as smoking does. So if you smoke and you have LPA, you have a double hit, and those are the women and men who have their MIs in their 30s and 30, 35 years of age. And I think direct LDL and LDL subfractions add very little. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that we stop here, and I don't talk about hypertriglyceridemia and pancreatitis. If you're severely hypertriglyceridemic, you get acute recurrent pancreatitis, and you get the triglyceride down, and it doesn't come back. That's in a summary. So questions? <laughs>
Yeah. In patients with no frenulum risks, particularly, but on a screening that have isolated low HDL, do they end up having lipoprotein abnormalities? Usually, because you said you usually find one of those abnormalities in anyone who has some sort of risk. Is that associated with something? And if so, is it useful to treat? Yeah. The, there are families uh, where the major lipid abnormality is a low HDL cholesterol. And actually, Greg Brown did another study I didn't talk about called the HDL atherosclerosis treatment study, where he showed that treatment with statins and nicotinic acid also decreased their coronary disease by about 60 percent. So it is a risk factor. What it's due to is not very well known. There, there are mutations in APOA1 that are associated, uh, if you're homozygous for it, are associated with very low HDL cholesterol levels. There's a, a transporter called. Uh, uh, Oh, goodness gracious. I'm forgetting, I'm blocking what it is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that facilitates the export of free cholesterol out of cells to HDL. It's dumb, dumb, dumb. Oh, so what are, what are the, the drug transporters, the multiple resistant? Give me one of them. Yeah, that's, that's the gut one. What are the ones that are out in the periphery in cells? Anyway. There's a disease that if you're homozygous for mutation in this particular protein, you have no HDL and you have a disease called Tangier's disease with great big orange tonsils, extremely rare. Most of the HDL abnormalities, we don't know why they occur. They're often associated with hypertriglyceridemia and with small dense LDL. So it looks a lot like familial combined hyperlipidemia, but the ApoB levels are normal and the ApoA1 levels are quite low. And most of those people are at risk for premature coronary artery disease. Yes, hi, John. I, I think you mentioned it, it, it's one of those risk scores or risk calculators where you think that the, the, the contribution of age is overly weighted in the formula. Could you expand on what that, what you mean yeah, by that? Yeah, that's the, the Framingham uh, risk score. Uh, the Framingham people have, have focused on total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, blood pressure, and uh, those are the main things that do, and age, which age is the number, if you're going to have a myocardial infarction, the most likely reason for it would be that you live long enough that sometime you're going to get one someday if you live long enough. That's not what I've been talking about today. So what they don't fit into their equation is triglyceride or any of the other things that three quarters of the people who have premature coronary disease have. People have suggested putting in the waist circumference or triglyceride levels or other things, but the way it stands right now, if you're looking at a young person who just had a myocardial infarction, you plug them into their score, it doesn't work. They're not old enough. So I, I think it, it is not as good as it might be. There are other, there are other uh, calculators out there. Uh, the ADA has one. There's uh, one from uh, the UK PDS, the, their study. They developed one, including diabetes. So they're out there, but in fact, I think that if you ha have the things <clears throat> or measure the things we talked about today, you don't need to do that risk score. You, need, you know you can identify the high, very high risk person and you treat that pe person aggressively. So we're here. Yes? Why do you think statins work? I think statins work because they lower the major contributor to the particle leading to cholesterol ester uptake by macrophages in the arterial wall. So. They block cholesterol synthesis. They decrease intrahepatic cholesterol concentration. That upregulates the hepatic LDL receptor, and that takes the LDL out of the blood to supply the needs for the deliver uh, to make other to make lipoproteins, to make bile acids, et cetera, et cetera. So, is LDL the best measurement of efficacy of statin treatment? I think that it is probably the only measure of efficacy because it doesn't selectively get rid of small dense LDL. It doesn't do much to VLDL or triglyceride. And it doesn't really do much to HDL. Uh, so that the, it is a LDL lowering agent. It's the nicotinic acid and the several other drugs that actually complementarily work in a complementary way with the, with the statins to get rid of selectively of the small dense LDL to raise the HDL2 to get rid of the remnant lipoproteins and lower LDL even more. So it's, that's why I think the, the, it's possible that, that, that double therapy or triple therapy with other drugs and people who really need it may in fact do away with premature coronary disease. Yes? 
questions very related. One, if you were advising the president and his medical advisors, what would you have Medicare and, and Medicaid reimbursed with regard to um, cardiovascular um, disease risk assessment? And the related question is, why do the, the, the market for these for the Berkeley and all that is almost two hundred million dollars a year now? When you add up life of sciences, Berkeley Heart, and uh, that, why is that? That's a uh, PR. It's, it's public relations, advertising, uh, you know, the Superco used to be with Berkeley Heart would go around all of the, to all of the medical societies and talk. Odvos does the same thing for liposcience. Uh, the VAP isn't very, isn't, isn't, I don't think that's a big money making thing like the others. There's actually a new method called ion mobility that was developed by Ron Krauss at Berkeley. Uh, who actually was initiated the Berkeley Heart Lab and then got out when it became commercial. But uh, it's a new method which actually may work very well and Quest has taken it over and there's a publication on it in clinical chemistry about a year ago. So that may be another thing coming along. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, maybe they have no role. Now, if it turns out that lipoproteins are not a risk factor for somebody who doesn't have a coronary event by age 70. The preliminary data would suggest that's the case. If the big, very large study shows that's the case, then Medicare doesn't have to worry about it for screening purposes and only has to pay for, peop the, for people who have testing and drugs who developed it prematurely and are still alive going into their 70s and 80s when all their siblings who weren't treated died in their 40s and 50s and they quit smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Medic, Medicaid, uh, I think that Medicaid should cover measuring screening things for lipids in middle-aged adults. I think Medicaid should cover uh, statin therapy and uh, nicotinic acid therapy. Now, it turns out that if you use nicotinic acid as niospan, that's a, that's a long, slow-release niospan you take once a day at bedtime, costs you about $200 a month. If you go to Costco and you buy 1,000 500 milligram tablets, it costs you $18 a year. <laughs> so I mean, and, and what, what the long-acting niacin people, the, the, the people who make these, have convinced the American Heart Association to recommend against the slow release, I mean the rapid regular old crystal and niacin because in the past, many over-the-counter niacins had no nicotinic acid in them at all. We've shown recently that they all have what they say, so. Yes. What's, um, uh, what medications could you talk a lot about ABLE B? What, I don't know of any medication, but you can tell us how can help to lower that. You know, the if you have an LDL particle yeah. and you lower that LDL particle with a statin, oh, okay. it has an APO, one APO B on it, so it goes down. You know, if you have a whole, if you have big fat LDL, then the cholesterol will go down more than the APO B. But if you have it where it's one to one, uh, then they go down together. Uh, other drugs will actually, if you add them to the statin, I think, I think statin is the base, the base of all therapy and is adding the appropriate second drug that makes the difference. And nicotinic acid uh, has a major impact on uh, getting, lowering ApoB levels as well as uh, uh, getting rid of small dense LDL. There's no other questions. Maybe Dr. Brunzel will hang out. I want to thank you for a great Thank you.